Hi everybody, my name is Nicole Lamberson. I'm a physician assistant and I serve on the Medical Advisory Board at Benzodiazepine Information Coalition. This video is going to be a short commentary um, in reaction to the Lisa Ling episode called The Benzo Crisis that aired on CNN on October 6th. In this video, I briefly just wanna to touch on what the show got right, which was a lot of things actually, and just go over the most important take home points um, from the show. I also wanna talk about some things that the show didn't cover and that are really important to understanding the actual crux um, of the benzodiazepine prescription problem. So before I get started, we just wanna take a moment to thank Lisa Ling and um, part two productions for doing such a fabulous job on this episode. Um, I've been involved in benzodiazepine activism for many, many years, and we've never had an experience where the media um, that we've worked with spent so much time and effort in trying to really understand the problem and what um, is happening in real life and listening to our stories and making sure that they got it right and Lisa and her crew did exactly that. So we are um, extremely grateful for having had this experience to work so closely as a nonprofit organization with Lisa Ling and her production crew and to have such a fabulous outcome. In the end, that is a great education tool for um, the general public to really learn about what benzodiazepines are and what they're doing to people. So let's jump in quickly to what the episode got right. First of all, one of the biggest take home points is that benzodiazepines should be used for intermittent use only, like one off type uses. You have a panic attack once a month or you need to take uh, benzodiazepines before you get on an airplane when you travel very infrequently. Or they should be limited if they're being used successively to about two weeks or less. Some guidelines say two to four weeks, but the four week part should include the tapering off period. But even four weeks is kind of risky. We've seen people in our support groups who did develop physical dependence in a very, very short period of time, less than four weeks. So if you're gonna use them successively um, every single day or multiple times a day, you should limit the use to the smallest dose possible and the least amount of time um, taken successively. As Lisa pointed out in the episode, however, this is not happening in real life. Physicians are prescribing these medications long-term for their patients, and they're not telling the patients at the time of prescription and repeat prescriptions, hey, these drugs are risky, especially if you're taking them long-term and you're taking them every single day. So patients aren't being told, they're not getting informed consent. So what happens with um, long-term use or successive use that is for more than a few weeks is patients develop what is called physical dependence or physiological dependence. Um, and that's a word or term that was used in the show appropriately um, by Dr. Anna Lemke um, when she explained what happens when you take benzodiazepines long-term. And basically it just means that repeated exposure to the drug causes your body to neuroadapt or to um, basically become accustomed to the presence of this drug in your system. So it causes physiological changes where your body learns how to function only in the presence of the drug. So you've developed a physiological or physical dependence. This is different from addiction. This is not drug abuse. This is not um, diversion. This is just taking your medication just like your doctor told you to and your body is physically adapted to the presence of the drug. So the reason why this is important is because when you become physiologically dependent, 
you can experience a withdrawal syndrome upon attempts at cessation of that drug. Withdrawal syndromes are possible and they can be severe, especially if not done properly. Um, what Lisa touched on was that the medical community is undereducated in um, the fact that you can't just tell patients, for the most part, to cut the dose in half and then cut the dose in half again and be off of the medication in four weeks. Um, patients are reporting that this is much too fast, their body cannot reverse the physiological dependence in such a short period of time. Doing those kinds of withdrawals um, directed by the doctor in such a short period of time are having disastrous results. And so um, Lisa showed Chrissy Tyrell doing a um, patient-driven taper, which is what most people wind up having to do once they become physiologically dependent on this drug. Um, unfortunately, a lot of these patient-driven tapers are not recognized by medicine. They're not understood. The patients have had to get creative at home and find their own way to get off of these medications because there's no help from medicine in order to do it. The drugs do not come in small enough doses for you to be able to um, you know, wean yourself as slowly as is required by these very potent um, medications. And so patients are at home. They're having to come up with methods and ways in order to get themselves off the drug, which sometimes translates into micro tapering, which is what we saw Chrissy doing in the show. She dissolved her benzodiazepine in a liquid in order to be able to titrate out the tiniest amounts of dose in order to reduce much more slowly and in accordance with what her body can handle. And it actually worked for her and it works for a lot of people. Um, if you get in the support groups that are many and online where people gather um, who have this prescribed problem, and support and help each other, you'll see that this is common, um, that patients are having to resort to these kind of methods to free themselves from the physiological dependence that the drugs have caused. So the reality is that not only are patients having trouble um, getting off of the medication, it's that the tapers are difficult and they can last for a very long time. I think most of medicine thinks that people can go on these drugs and even if they become physically dependent, that's okay because they'll just taper off. And that nonchalant attitude is because I believe that most of medicine thinks that you can just taper off of these drugs in a couple of weeks, but that is not reality for most people. What we're seeing is long tapers people suffering while they're tapering um, and they are having to taper sometimes for many many months and even years there are tapers that have to go on for years and that is because the smallest reductions are causing so much suffering that the patient simply just cannot reduce any faster than they're going and so this becomes a very very long process in order to rid yourself of this medication that you really didn't have an idea in the first place that could cause these types of issues. So you can see where patients are angry and upset over finding themselves caught in this cobweb. So the next point that um, the episode got right is that too rapid withdrawals can cause severe um, suffering intolerable suffering for many people um, and it can lead to suicide. Um, one thing Lisa did touch on in the episode is that people are reporting uh, these suicidal urges and thoughts and thinking and that's correct. Um, when people are coming off of benzodiazepines they often say that they felt like compulsed to die um, or to take their own lives. But there's another element to the suicide angle as well that wasn't covered, and that is that some people commit suicide in this, and we know because they leave notes and they tell us, or they're in our support groups and they tell their friends in the groups, they just give up because the suffering is so severe 
it is so long lasting and they lose hope. They, they can't take it anymore. It is the worst um, suffering that some people report that they've ever had in their lives. And we're talking about from people who have been at war or from people who have had cancer and they say no. Benzodiazepine injury and um, withdrawal is so much worse. Um, so there are some people who have just severe, long-lasting um, withdrawal syndromes, and they, they just commit suicide because the pain is too severe and the suffering just goes on for too long. Patients also commit suicide because they feel helpless, um, because this problem is very misunderstood and the doctors are not educated on it. So they go to the doctor in severe withdrawal, they are suffering horribly, and they explain what's happening, and they become invalidated. The doctor says, no, that's not possible, or um, it shouldn't last this long, um, or they just don't recognize it at all as being what it is. And then oftentimes, because medicine doesn't recognize it, their family members and their friends don't recognize it either. So they're told, by everyone to suck it up, um, stop, you know, making this up or just take your medicine again. You need to take your medication. Obviously, the doctor's saying you need to take it, but they desperately want off of this medicine and it's making them so completely ill to try to get off and nobody understands. And so not only are you suffering worse than you've ever suffered, you are completely isolated and alone and without validation for what you're going through. Another point that the episode made that was spot on was through the story about Lisa's father, who is elderly and he was prescribed a benzodiazepine. Um, so it's important for everyone to know that benzodiazepines are pretty much contraindicated in the elderly. Um, Except, except for you know extreme circumstances. However, in real life, this is not happening. Um, in some studies, actually, benzodiazepines are most prescribed to this group of people um, over 65, where they are the most dangerous and the most risky. Um, they increase the elderly's risk of falls, um, hip fractures, which if you're elderly and you get a hip fracture, that grossly increases your risk of death. Um, it causes all kinds of cognitive issues in the elderly. And so we got to see Lisa's dad um, in the episode struggling with um, problems from having been prescribed a benzodiazepine in older age. This is really important for the general public to know, not only for yourselves as you age, but also for those of you who have parents or elderly grandparents where you are going to be the medical power of attorney or taking care of people like that in your life um, so that you can recognize what is a benzodiazepine um, and you know how long is it being given to my loved one and what is it for and is this really necessary and is it safe? And so that leads into the very final point that is a great take home from this episode. And that is that you as a consumer, as a patient, um, cannot just walk into a, a doctor's office and blindly trust. You need to be your own best medical advocate. You need to read the pamphlets, like Lisa said, that come with the prescriptions. Um, and you need to get on the internet and research and look around and see what you can find about medications that you're being prescribed, benzodiazepines or other, um, and look and see if there's a support group for this medication. If there's a support group for this medication, chances are there are patients out there that are having problems taking it and coming off of it. While most doctors and medical providers want to do right by their patients and don't have any malicious intent in um, prescribing benzodiazepines or sleeping pills to their patients that eventually cause harm, um, I, I believe that they just do it out of place of a place of ignorance because this isn't taught in medical schools um, and so they just don't know. 
That said, even if they have all the best intentions, that isn't going to help you when you realize that you've been injured by this class of medication and it's too late. So we're hoping that people can watch this Lisa Ling episode, take heed to the warnings, and really um, learn a lesson that you have to be your own best medical advocate and do your own research and really understand the risk versus benefit profile of the medication that you're getting. And then you need to weigh the two and determine are the risks of taking this benzodiazepine worth it compared to what I'm taking it for? How bad is the condition that I have? And all, are there safer alternatives? Another take home point that was made in the episode is that benzodiazepines actually worsen anxiety and panic in the long run. So the irony is that they are prescribed a lot of times for people with anxiety. But if you're going to take them long term, what happens is the body can develop tolerance to the presence of the medication, at which point you start to develop withdrawal symptoms while you're still taking the benzodiazepine. So you're having rebound, which causes worsening anxiety, worsening panic. And so these drugs are not an effective treatment for anxiety or panic long term. They just exacerbate the condition and people wind up in worse, worse situations and worse um, cases of panic and anxiety than they had in the very beginning to begin with. And there are studies that show this. Um, there was a, a Xanax study done by Upjohn themselves, the makers, the pharmaceutical company, and it showed that the long-term results were disastrous. The patients were worse off across the board, um, but what they did was deceptive. They only reported the short-term results, and they reported those to doctors, and they reported those to the general public, and they hyped the drug and said, oh, it works great. Well, it does. It did. It worked great in the short term but they did not report what happens when you've been on the drug for much longer. So now I just wanna to briefly touch on a few points that were not covered in the episode. And um, this is because we feel that they're really important and people really need to understand these points as well. This is not a slight to Lisa or the episode at all. Um, the benzodiazepine problem is complex. It has many tentacles. And so in order to understand it, it um, takes a long time. And sometimes you can't cover everything that needs to be said in a 45 minute segment. Um, it's hard to blog about this issue, which I've done many times myself, because you need word count. You need to be able to tell about all these different um, things that are happening. And so sometimes things just are left out. So I wanna to now touch on just a couple of things that are really important for the public to know um, also about benzodiazepines. So in my opinion, the real story here is that benzodiazepines can cause withdrawal. Yes, they do. But medicine really recognizes withdrawal as something that lasts for just a couple of weeks and then it goes away. So that would be unfortunate. I mean, it would really suck that patients were having to suffer some withdrawals, but if they went away within a couple of weeks, it's like, okay, you know, you explain that to the patient and it's, it's a risk, but it's small because you get through it in time. But with the benzodiazepines, that is not actually what's happening. I mean, yes, some people do get a very short withdrawal syndrome like that. It goes away and they're back to their lives quickly. However, benzodiazepines also cause protracted syndromes, and these syndromes last months and years in some people, and even up to a decade in some people, and they can be devastating. Um, it, it can be severe, it can be long-lasting. People are losing their jobs, their homes, their marriages, their families, their ability to function and socialize. They can't drive cars for years. They can't leave their homes for years. And so this is much worse than just withdrawal. Um, this is life devastating consequences that can take 
from people a lot. It can be life ruining. It can take years of your life to overcome this injury. Um, if you ever do it all, there is a small percentage of people too who can have permanent neurological injury from having taken these medications and they have lingering symptoms um, that don't go away, at least as far as we know or have followed them. There just really aren't enough studies about um, this phenomenon of protracted harm. Um, the word protracted really just means the time sequence that it goes on and on and on. Um, sometimes people call this protracted withdrawal. Uh, we like to kind of veer away from using that language because again, when medicine hears withdrawal, they think a couple of weeks. And so protracted withdrawal, they don't really understand. Um, not to mention that this is more than withdrawal. You, for someone has been away from the medication for years and years and years, they aren't withdrawing anymore. They are injured, they are having um, the result of whatever insult or um, neurotoxicity that the drug caused in their brain and body when they took it and when they came off of it. So the real story here is not that people are having a couple weeks of withdrawal symptoms, but that people are having months and years of um, symptoms that can be physical, neurological, um, psychological, uh, um, they have memory loss, they have all kinds of horrible um, symptoms that are persisting for a very long time. As for how many people who uh, will go on to get the protracted syndrome, we don't know. The studies are lacking. Um, we do know that it's a minority. We also know that the risk is greater in people who have been rapidly tapered, people who have taken the drugs for a long period of time, and also people who have been polydrugged on multiple agents, which is a typical outcome in benzodiazepine patients because of the lack of education around benzodiazepines. Again, people get benzos, they have adverse effects, they go to the doctor, the doctor doesn't know what it is, and so the doctor starts prescribing more agents. They misdiagnose this, and then the patient winds up on three, four, five, six, drugs, all because of what the benzodiazepine was causing initially. For people experiencing these protracted syndromes, there really is no research about it, no help, n very little recognition. And again, some people in their lives, simply because it goes on for so long, um, it's so severe, they lose hope. They have no um, support from family or friends or the medical community, and they fear that it's permanent. I myself suffer from a protracted injury from prescribed benzodiazepines. I have not taken a benzodiazepine in seven years, and I still have symptoms. Um, I was an over-rapid cold turkey patient, a detox center, ripped me off of benzodiazepines and polypharmacy that was a result of my benzodiazepine prescription being misdiagnosed as other problems. And so yeah, I am a classic case of protracted harm. I have slowly gotten um, somewhat better over time, but the symptoms are still completely debilitating. Um, worse on some days than others. I still miss life events. I missed my cousin's wedding last weekend because it was five hours away and I couldn't get there. Um, this has interrupted my life and the fact that it happened during my prime years, so I've not been able to get married or have children or do the things that my peers have been able to do because I have been sick and recovering from the neuro insult that these prescribed benzodiazepines inflicted upon my body. So there's all of these, you know, long-term consequences to this protracted injury. All the time you can't work, you're not investing in your 401k, you're not putting money into a mortgage. Um, just think about the cumulative effect of being out of work and disabled by a medication for many, many years. This is the story. This is the problem of what benzodiazepines are capable of and why they are so incredibly dangerous. To close, one other thing that Lisa didn't really touch on in the episode was the fact that 
yes, patients should be reading the FDA information that comes with medications. They should be reading the pamphlets. They should be asking the doctors and the pharmacists. However, not everything is in there. There's not enough research on this class of medications. And so, yes, there's gonna be information in the pamphlets that warn, but it, it doesn't go into detail about the risk of these protracted syndromes or how severe and disabling and life limiting these can be. And so you can read over those pamphlets and you can get some information of your relative risk, but if the information isn't there, how are patients to know that that is the real risk that they're taking? So at this point, if you really want to know about those types of risks, your best bet is to get on to some of the support forums like benzobuddies.org where you can go into the protracted section of the forum and you can read what these people are experiencing and for how long they're having the symptoms. Yes, it's anecdotal information, but it is still information and it's valid because it's overwhelming. The evidence is overwhelming. There are hundreds of thousands of people suffering from this drug class. Their stories are real, they're important, and they're need, they need to be heard. So thank you so much, Lisa Ling and Part 2 Productions for taking the time to listen to our stories, to hear us, to believe us, to validate us, to be angry with us, to fight back with us, and most of all, to get the word out there, to educate the general public, to educate the medical profession, to educate would-be patients who might take one of these drugs so that people can be aware and be informed. That is all we want. We want people to understand what they're getting themselves into ahead of time. We want people to have the knowledge that we wish we would have had before we traveled this path so that we can make a truly informed decision. Okay, I hope everybody enjoyed watching the episode. And if you haven't seen it, you really should go watch it. Share it with your family and friends. Talk about this. Warn people. Um, and let them know that benzodiazepines really come with a lot of issues that everybody should be aware of and know about. Thank you. Thank you.